You guys, this is Patriot Act, or as it's known in Saudi Arabia, error 404, not found. <laughs> in case you don't know the full story, back in October, we did an episode about the Crown Prince of Saudi Arabia, Mohammed bin Salman, and his involvement in the killing of Washington Post journalist, Jamal Khashoggi, and the kingdom wasn't thrilled. Well, Netflix under fire today after its decision to pull an episode of a comedy show that was critical of Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman. Patriot Act, uh, with Hassan <laughs> Minhan, is that it? Minhaj, yeah. Minhaj. Netflix confirmed it removed the episode from streaming in Saudi Arabia after the country's Communications and Information Technology Commission made a request that it take it down. A request? <laughs> Does MBS think Netflix is a wedding DJ? <laughs> A, a quick request. Uh, we just take down that one episode that's criticizing me and then just play Ushers, yeah. A request is when a neighbor tells you to turn the music down. A demand is when that neighbor is Conor McGregor and you're in his parking spot. I still can't believe it. We got Saudi Arabia to issue its very own Muslim ban. Netflix says it received a request, a legal request actually, from Saudi Arabia to remove this episode. Saudi Arabian officials cited Article 6 of their anti-cyber crime law. Cybercrime? You're telling me even in Saudi prison I'll be associated with the IT department? <laughs> okay, let's break down how I became an internet bad boy. According to Article 6 of the Saudi Arabian anti-cyber crime law, any content that impinges on public order, religious values, or public morals is prohibited. Of all the Netflix originals, the only show <laughs> that Saudi Arabia thinks violates Muslim values is the one hosted by a Muslim. <laughs> Do you know what's still streaming in Saudi Arabia? We got access to Netflix in Saudi Arabia through an online proxy, which allows you to make it look like your IP address is from another country. So this is Netflix in Saudi Arabia. These shows are still streaming. Sabrina, still up. It has literal devil worship and a lot of premarital witch sex. <laughs> Bojack Horseman. There is an alcoholic horseman who snorts cocaine. <laughs> and let's not forget those evil cooking shows. Porky goodness. Vitamin P. Fat from the hog, a la natural. It must be like Christmas every time you break open a new pig. <laughs> This is Haram City. Not eating pork is the one rule every Muslim agrees on. I have a cousin who's atheist, and he'll be rolling a blunt while drinking, and he'll still be like, hey man, is there pepperoni on that pizza? <laughs> Look, I don't know if there's a God, but if there is one, he hates pepperoni. <laughs> you know the most bizarre thing about this entire censorship fiasco? Saudi Arabia was our second episode, and you can see right here, it's missing. Okay? But in our last episode, in December, episode seven, we had another segment criticizing MBS, and it was called Saudi Arabia Update. <laughs> yeah, our episode titles are super straightforward. They're like an email from your parents. <laughs> the subject line tells you exactly what you're gonna get. Subject, Hassan, I have a question about the Roku. Email, Hassan, I have a question about the Roku. That episode, is still streaming on Netflix in Saudi Arabia. If you're gonna crush all forms of dissent, don't half-ass it. But that's what happens when you got a country that's run by people who got their job just because of their dad. <laughs> now here's the irony. By censoring our episode, Saudi Arabia made us go viral. Have they never heard of the Streisand effect? It was great for the show. I got 60 new IG followers, it was great. <laughs> this story, got covered by everyone across the political spectrum. For the first time in my life, I was a bipartisan icon. Yes. Liberals and conservatives. They both embraced me like I was money from Big Pharma. Cory Booker just bear hugged me like, ah, get over here, buddy. Even Breitbart defended me, Breitbart. Do you know how hard it was for Breitbart? They didn't like look at a picture of me and MBS and be like, which one is browner? <laughs> Is there a third option to hate? <laughs> so hard for him. Let me be absolutely clear. I am not a victim here at all. I'm lucky, okay? I have the freedom to call Saudi Arabia the boy band manager of 9-11. I can criticize my own government without any fear of repercussions. I can say Stephen Miller deported his own hair for being brown. I can say those things 
But those freedoms don't exist in Saudi Arabia. Dozens of activists sit in Saudi jails, many without formal charges. So while I can make a joke about being a cyber criminal, this is no joke for many Saudi activists. According to Reprieve, a human rights advocacy group, that vague cybercrime law that we allegedly broke, it is the very same law that is regularly cited in Saudi court to justify death sentences, like in the case of Ali al Namir, a teenager who was sentenced to death for protesting and using his Blackberry to spread information about protests. This isn't about just censoring one episode of a TV show. It's about the precedent. Because as tech companies keep expanding, they're gonna keep running into more vague censorship laws, laws that can allow governments to pull any content at any time. Ultimately, Saudi doesn't care about immoral content that impinges on religious values. They're mad that a Muslim is airing out their dirty laundry. Now look, I've already been banned in one country, so I was thinking, look, <laughs> you're not built for this beef. <laughs> Let's talk about something a little less controversial. China. <laughs> Don't worry. Netflix isn't in China. The only thing they binge watch is their own people. China, of course, has some of the toughest restrictions on the internet. No Facebook, no YouTube. The Chinese Communist Party enforces a draconian system of censorship, dictating what Chinese can search, and they've done it for years. If you go to sites like Twitter, Google, and Facebook, this is what you get. If you can't see that screen, that's exactly the point. China controlling its internet is a remarkable accomplishment that America never thought would be possible. Now, there's no question China has been trying to crack down on the internet. <laughs> Good luck. <laughs> That's sort of like trying to nail Jello to the wall. That is such a creepy clip to watch right now. Not just because of how wrong he was about China, but because we're all picturing him nailing Jello to the wall in the same way, right? With his penis? Okay, good. <laughs> For China's 1.4 billion citizens and 800 million internet users, censorship is just part of life. China is so good at censorship, they gave themselves five stars. In China, censorship is a complex ecosystem of human beings, telecom and tech companies, and laws. That all gives the Communist Party and China's president, Xi Jinping, the ability to control what can be seen on the internet in real time. It's something known as the Great Firewall, which I know sounds like a dessert at P.F. Chang's, but there are whole pieces of Chinese history that the government doesn't allow to be taught in schools, and they've been scrubbed from the internet. The last major political protest in China was the spring of 1989. Thousands of people gathered in Tiananmen Square to protest for democratic reforms. But on June 4th, 1989, the Chinese army opened fire on the crowd, killing citizens, and here, are some Chinese millennials today being asked about it. Do you learn about Tiananmen Square in history books? Uh, not mentioned. Not yeah, mentioned. Yeah, not, not mentioned. mentioned. Not, not mentioned. mentioned at all. That's crazy. That's like asking a kid in high school, in America, if 9-11 is in their history book, and they're like, 9-11? <laughs> the day Jay-Z came out with the blueprint? <laughs> You'd be like, how is that in your history book? <laughs> So if you're Chinese and you're living in a world where the government decides what you can and can't see, that must be some sort of dystopian nightmare, right? You're in China. The government can know everything about the you. The government already know everything about me. It's just, yeah, so if I, I'm not committing a crime, they don't give a shit. The bottom line is, the Chinese in general are less concerned about data privacy than the consumers out in the West. There's some subtle rules in China. But if you follow it, you respect it, you still have the freedom to experience it. Remember, this is a rap battle organizer <laughs> telling you to follow the rules. What a fucking nerd. If NWA started in China, fuck the police would have been called, sorry, officer, I'll try to be more careful next time. <laughs> yes, websites like Google, Twitter, Facebook, and YouTube are all blocked, but no one cares because they all have great Chinese doppelgangers like Baidu, Weibo, Yuku, and WeChat, which blows Facebook out of the water. Life under censorship is pretty good if you're just taking selfies, being thick on Yuku, or shit posting on Weibo. And to anyone over 35, I swear to God, most of those words were English. <laughs> However, if you're an activist, 
This is where things can get very scary, especially under China's President Xi Jinping. Since coming to power, he has crushed all forms of dissent. China is carrying out a broad crackdown on people accused of spreading so-called rumors online. Zhang Aijia, a former school counselor, showed us the message she reposted on social media, an apparent jab at China's President Xi Jinping. Police showed up at her school to question her, and days later she was fired. Someone got fired for insulting the president online? That's the only way to get a job in my industry right now. That's how this all happened. President Xi has clamped down on NGOs, locked up human rights lawyers, and issued sweeping new cybercrime laws. He even temporarily bans words and phrases like, I disagree, I oppose, and my emperor, words that question his authority. And for some reason, he's also banned the words, roll up sleeves, and I'm willing to be a vegetarian for the rest of my life. <laughs> I feel like the only explanation is that President Xi had his heart broken by a stubborn vegetarian with beautiful forearms. <laughs> and he's like, it is now illegal to remind me of her. <laughs> God, I miss Susan so much. <laughs> Xi isn't just censoring words and historic events. He is censoring huge news stories in real time. The Communist Party in China is persecuting a Muslim minority group called Uyghurs. But if you live in China, chances are you don't know any of this. Across the northwestern province of Xinjiang, an estimated one million Chinese Muslims have vanished into a vast network of detention centers for what China calls re-education. After initially denying the existence of prison camps, Beijing now says it is sending an unspecified number of people for vocational training free of charge. Vocational training free of charge. Oh, I get it. America never had Japanese internment camps. Those were desert getaways for the Asian American community. <laughs> North Korea doesn't have labor camps, they're WeWorks. <laughs> There's no Wi-Fi, everyone's just really efficient. There's one more. <laughs> you guys are like, is he gonna keep going? There's a third. Bangladesh doesn't have sweatshops, those are Bikram workspaces. <laughs> China doesn't want the world to know what's really happening in the detention centers online. People have to move fast to get information before the government takes it down. And this is probably how it's going to be for quite some time. China's ruling Communist Party proposed Sunday to remove term limits on the office of president. That means Xi Jinping, who heads the party and the military, may never have to leave office. Xi Jinping will never retire. It's the one thing he has in common with millennials. <laughs> Xi promotes a policy of cyber sovereignty, which he defines as the idea that China has the right to control information within its borders and block whatever the CCP deems harmful. It basically lets them take down anything they want whenever they want, even if it's completely random. Okay, so the British children's show Peppa Pig is very popular with kids worldwide, but it's being banned in China for an unexpected reason. The sassy cartoon character has come to be associated with counterculture. She allegedly promotes gangster attitudes. <laughs> Peppa Pig is a gangster? Is Thomas the Tank Engine transporting Special K? <laughs> what is going on? At some point, the ban on Peppa Pig was lifted, and that's why censorship is such a mindfuck in China. The government is constantly changing what's allowed and what's not. So activists and censors are in a constant game of cat and mouse. Activists are constantly having to find new ways to evade the censors, and then censors are always looking for new ways to silence the activists. Take the case of Chen Guangcheng, known as CGC, or the blind lawyer. The blind lawyer became an icon of human rights abuses in China after he exposed the way thousands of women had undergone forced abortions. For seven years, he was held here under illegal house arrest. He and his family beaten savagely, guarded round the clock. Activists started the hashtag FreeCGC on social media, and then censors immediately blocked all the hashtags. To get around the censors, activists then asked supporters to post selfies dressed up as the blind lawyer, and they did, and the response was incredible, even though they all look like they're auditioning to play Barbecue Becky. But then, <laughs> something crazy happened. Mr. Chen has spent the last 18 months under house arrest, but last Sunday, he escaped. A blind lawyer escaped house arrest? <laughs> Can you imagine being the guard that let a blind lawyer slip away? <laughs> How could both of them not see anything? 
as people started finding out Chen escaped, censors got to work, taking down his initials and even the words blind man. To get around the censors, activists hit back with an incredibly powerful weapon, memes. Now, I know in America, memes are just used to humanize Squidward, but in China, <laughs> they're also a popular tool for dissent. In the case of the blind lawyer, this meme went viral. Yeah, that's the pig from Angry Birds staring at the tunnel in the Shawshank Redemption. <laughs> Shawshank memes became so popular, the censors blocked any mention of the Shawshank Redemption. By the way, for any people watching in China, Tim Robbins escapes from prison. You totally don't see it coming, kind of like the blind lawyer escaping. <laughs> Clearly, the CCP always has the upper hand when it comes to censoring content. They have the resources, the infrastructure, the manpower, all of which makes it really hard for any grassroots movement to gain momentum. However, in the last year, there's been a new movement that has started to take hold in China, and it may be unlike anything that has ever come before it. Me too. In the US, it's been championed by celebrities, in China, it's a fledgling movement led mainly by university students. China's Me Too movement has been called one of the first coordinated student protest movements since Tiananmen Square. The Me Too movement is a unique problem for the CCP because the Communist Party is technically founded on egalitarian principles, the same way America is technically founded on the idea of democracy. And Maroon 5 is technically founded on the idea of music. <laughs> Even from the CCP's early days, Mao famously said, women hold up half the sky. The CCP's doctrine is equality for all, but that hasn't stopped them from telling women what to do with their bodies. Once notorious for its strict one-child policy, China now considering proposals to push women to have more babies. Beijing is worried that having one of the lowest birth rates in the world will undermine its efforts to stimulate the economy. For years, they outlawed having more than one child. Now, they're trying to shame single women into getting married and having babies by calling them leftover women. Even Mike Pence wouldn't support this. He'd be like, look, government isn't about forcing women to have babies. It's about forcing women to keep them. <laughs> keep your eye on the ball, she. And he's like, I'm sorry. I can't stop thinking about Susan. <laughs> Maybe I should have compromised and been a vegetarian. <laughs> insecure are you, CCP? They're basically one step away from passing a law that says all Chinese men have girlfriends. They just go to a different high school, okay? <laughs> but now that Me Too has surfaced, it's clear women have had enough. They want the CCP to make good on the founding values of the party, equality. And they're speaking out online in a way they never have before. Despite censorship, a huge part of why Me Too has taken off is because of social media. Me Too in China effectively started on January 1st of 2018, after Lu Shishi, a former PhD student, posted on social media claiming she had been sexually assaulted by her advisor in 2004, which he denied, but the post blew up. Since Lu Shishi first reported the abuse on Sina Weibo on January 1st, her complaint has been viewed around five million times. I stepped up simply because I don't want other people to get hurt. But the discussion and the reactions on the internet and in Chinese society have really surprised me. Censors eventually took down a majority of the Me Too posts and the variations of the hashtag. That's when the arms race began. To dodge the censors, China's women started using Chinese words that sounded similar to Me Too. So in Chinese, me means rice, and two means bunnies. So China's Me Too activists became rice bunnies. Which, if you listen to it, it kind of sounds like something Steve Harvey got fired for saying. It's like, hey, what's up, you rice bunny? And they're like, Steve, why are you saying that? And he's like, think like a man. Activists posted rotated photos of text which makes messages unsearchable and even use blockchain to make a Me Too letter harder to delete. And that totally makes sense because no one knows what the fuck blockchain is. <laughs> Bitcoin is at 3,000. Since Lu Shishi's story hit Weibo, thousands of students have petitioned their colleges for anti-harassment policies. This is a big deal because in China, sexual harassment is rampant. A survey of 7,000 students by NGO, the Guangzhou Gender Center, found while almost 70% of respondents had been sexually harassed, only 4% reported it to the authorities. More than 50% of female commuters have been assaulted while riding China's subways. Dozens of women have come forward to accuse some pretty high-profile men, like TV host Zhu Juen. He was accused by a woman named Zhou Xiaoxuan, who claims he harassed her 
when she was a 20-year-old intern and he was almost 50. Yeah, Ju has denied the allegations, but this was a huge deal because Ju Juen is one of China's most famous TV anchors known for hosting the state New Year's Gala. That was Ju Juen with a bunch of spring chickens, which also happens to be his ideal age range on Tinder. Now, a big reason why so many women have had to turn to social media is because if you're assaulted or harassed, there are very few good legal options. China's legal system is poorly set up for dealing with assault allegations. There's no legal definition of sexual harassment here and no standardized way of reporting sexual assault. China has very little recourse for victims of sexual assault, and that's something activists have been fighting to change long before Me Too. Activists like Ling Xiaowen, she has organized protests and co-founded a grassroots feminist NGO, which are risky things to do in China. So I sat down with her to talk about her work. The world is kind of hostile to, to, to women who want things. It scares people because women are standing up. Tell me about the things that your family has had to go through because of your activism. Years ago, um, I was trying to host a seminar about um, women's rights, but then I received a call from my dad. He told me that um, not only in local police, but also um, his employer, his boss, is at his home now. So it, the police went to the police friends and coworkers to talk to your yes. parents? Yes. And then the parents would go, please don't do this. And that generally works because Asian parents can crush dreams. Yeah. Do you hear that? That's the sigh of a thousand A minuses. <laughs> Yo, President Xi doing this is some straight up Nyla Auntie bullshit. Like, I'm not gonna go to you directly. I'll find the parents to crush their dreams. <laughs> And because of pressure from the police through the parents and her family, Xiao Wen came to the United States to study and to continue to fight for women's rights in China. What does the Chinese government think about the work you're doing? The Chinese government would consider us to be Western hostile forces or being controlled by Western hostile forces. What would they consider me? Well, if you are that important, then they will consider you as Western hostile forces. Are you saying I'm not important? Not in China. <laughs> I'm sorry. Have they seen the show? Mm, I have seen your show. No, but have they seen the show? What show? The show you're on. This show. I don't know. But if I'm in it, I'll promise that at least some people will see it. Have they seen the spy who dumped me? No, I don't know. I mean, I haven't. Did they see MTV's Disaster Date season four? Now you're just making things up. No, I'm not! Listen, Party Rock Anthem had come out that year, and I thought Red Foo was gonna be the next Justin Timberlake. Okay, so Xiao Wen's credits are a bit more impressive than mine. She has worked closely with a group called the Feminist Five, who made international headlines back in 2015. These women are singing on the Beijing subway to raise awareness against abuse and discrimination. And here, dressing up as blood-stained brides to encourage women to stand up against domestic violence. But five of these women were detained recently for what authorities called picking quarrels. It is hilarious to me that men relegated women to secretarial work for decades, and now we turn around and we're like, where did these women learn to organize and plan meetings? <laughs> Who is responsible for this? Why are they picking quarrels? The global backlash to the detention of the Feminist Five was so intense, the CCP actually released the women after 37 days. I was uh, going to be sentenced over five years. They didn't beat me, yeah. They, they don't touch me, maybe due to the, a lot of pressure from uh, uh, internal and external. If they insulted my sexual orientation, it doesn't work. Yeah, that's it, because I'm a lesbian. What's wrong? What's up? Yeah, the CCP thought Peppa Pig was gangster? Nah, this is gangster. Just a few months after the five were released, President Xi spoke at the UN's women's conference 
and said this. In many parts of the world, however, disparities remain in the level of women's development. As we speak, various forms of discrimination against women are still taking place. Hmm, interesting choice to use a female translator. <laughs> He's like, see, I give women a voice. <laughs> What's next? Susan. <laughs> In the past year, Me Too has made some gains. What is the biggest victory that you've seen at the government level of your activism? The first one happened last year. The new civil code uh, explicitly said that employers should not sexually harass employees. And the second, now people can sue under sexual harassment and gender discrimination. That's, that's major. It is. The CCP has agreed to add a definition of sexual harassment to China's civil code. And the Supreme Court says you can now file a sexual harassment lawsuit for the first time in China. Remember creepy TV host Ju Juin, Spring Chickens? Remember him? <laughs> yes, he actually sued his accuser, Zhou Shaoxuan, and then she countersued him and is now trying to make her case a sexual harassment lawsuit. And if it is accepted by the court, it would be the first ever civil sexual harassment lawsuit in Chinese history. This is very different in the Me Too movement. No, people just don't let it go away anymore. People want these universities to say something, to do something, to change the situation. It's not what it's like before. People have suffered enough. Young women have suffered enough. They want, they, they demand changes. The CCP and President Xi are doing everything they can to consolidate power and silence anyone who speaks out. China's Me Too movement is persisting in the face of censorship, and it is inspiring, and we can only hope that these small victories will lead to even larger ones.